Hello, my name is Mary Janowski, and today I'd like to talk to you about double crop forages, in particular fall seeded cool season annuals for late fall or early spring forage. These cool season annuals that are planted after your cash crop and utilized for forage either uh, in the fall or in the spring are a great opportunity for a low cost, high quality forage. Um, that can be used to background calves or to feed lactating cows. What I have on this graph is the sum late summer and fall growing degree days as well as uh, the uh, traditional harvest dates for winter wheat, the male row destruction in seed corn, uh, the harvest dates for corn silage, and the harvest dates for soybeans. And as you can see we get a rapid decrease in the growing degree days which basically tells you the amount of heat that's accumulating uh, for growth of our cool season annuals decreases rapidly uh, throughout the late summer and early fall so after winter wheat we have a lot of opportunity to capture unused growing degree days uh, and with the traditional uh, harvest dates in July we can either plant a warm season annuals or we can plant cool season annuals, partic particularly uh, if you're going to plant after about August 10th. Uh, at that point, it's usually better to go uh, with a cool season annual, and that's what we're going to focus on today is cool season annuals. Uh, when we have seed corn, uh, when the mail rows are destroyed, there's a lot of light hitting the ground, and we can capitalize on that uh, and get a lot of growing degree days um, as well. In corn silage, we start uh, having a quite a reduction in the amount of growing degree days uh, early in the corn silage harvest period uh, we can produce a lot of fall forage uh, when we get to about uh, the middle of September uh, we really need to start thinking about moving towards uh, a forage that's planted in the fall but will be utilized in the spring so a winter hardy uh, cool season annuals and we'll talk about those as well and then of course for soybeans are really our only option our winter hardy cool season uh, annuals that will be utilized for spring forage production so I wanted to give you a good idea of what this uh, rapid decline in growing degree days really means and so if we look at August 25th and we look at uh, southwestern Nebraska and say okay how many growing degree days will accumulate after uh, planting on August 25th uh, we see it's about 2,000 growing degree days uh, when we back that up to September 8th and we look at the growing degree days so those 14 days there we uh, we lose uh, about a fourth of our growing degree days we're now at 1500 growing degree days well what does that really mean uh, what that means is that we get quite a reduction in the amount of potential plant growth. So I have here a picture of some purple top turnips and some daikon old seed radishes that were planted in clay center um, either on September 8th or August 25th. And you can see the substantial difference between the amount of growth from the August 25th planted and the September 8th planted. Uh, so uh, the bottom line is we want to um, commit to planting as quickly and as early as possible if you're looking for fall growth. And then the other part is uh, water is very important. So if you have the ability to irrigate um, and your soil moisture is not optimum, um, having irrigation for quick germination and emergence will, be, will allow you to be able to capitalize on those growing degree days. Uh, because it's really not uh, it's really not planted until it germinates uh, if it sits in the ground for two weeks it'll be the equivalent of you planting it two weeks later a lot of people say well uh, you know I can't afford to be out planting I need to be f harvesting and so I would point out that uh, because of the extra potential forage production it's probably worth hiring somebody to plant especially in those early harvested fields those are the ones that you can really get uh, the forage production on and so going ahead and making that happen is is probably worth your time 
So we'll talk about two uh, types of cool season annuals today, really the cereal grasses or the small cereal grains. Um, most of those have a full seeding rate that are around 100 to 120 pounds an acre. And basically full seeding rate just means that if you were to plant it in a mon monoculture, that's the seeding rate we would recommend. If you plant in a mix, then we're going to suggest that you cut back uh, from the full seeding rate of both the species. Uh, and a lot of times people are targeting between 100 and 150 percent of the full seeding rate for that mix. Uh, I have here two uh, most common types of cool season cereal grasses that are used for forage uh, in our intercropping systems. Uh, we have oats and we have cereal rye. You can see that the cost uh, per acre really isn't very different, but oats are winter sensitive and cereal rye is winter hardy, which means winter sensitive these oats will die out in the winter, they will not come back in the spring, whereas cereal rye will overwinter. We also have barley, triticale, and wheat, and for these three species uh, we can find both winter varieties, which should be winter hardy, and spring varieties, which are winter sensitive. I will say though that you have to look carefully at the winter varieties, especially for barley. Many of them are not hardy enough uh, to overwinter here in Nebraska. So some of you may be asking why would I plant uh, a winter sensitive uh, small cereal grain if, if uh, I, it won't overwinter. And the reason why you might uh, think about that is because the winter hardy species don't produce nearly as much forage in the fall as the winter sensitive. So if you're looking for fall forage, uh, winter hardy species uh, won't give you nearly as much as going ahead and planting a winter sensitive species. So you do have an option, however, of actually mixing the two, planting uh, both a winter sensitive and a winter hardy so you can have both fall and spring forage. And the data out there says that having winter sensitive species mixed in with your winter hardy will not reduce your spring yields of your winter hardy. So I also wanted to discuss brassicas, uh, turnips, kale, rape, collards, uh, mustard. Those are all brassicas as well as radishes, which I'll discuss in just a second. They are winter sensitive, meaning that they do die out over the winter. Uh, the nice thing about brassicas is because of their small seed size, they tend to have uh, a low seeding rate, uh, five pounds per acre. We get a lot of seeds in those five pounds. Uh, we don't recommend seeding uh, brassicas alone uh, because, uh, as I'll show you in a little while, they're low fiber, high sulfur, and so um, they don't produce a good uh, diet for uh, ruminants by themselves, but they're very high quality and they can produce a lot of rapid growth, so they are a good option to put into a mix with a grass. Uh, turnips, the purple top turnip is very cheap, $1.80 a pound. Uh, if you were to seed it alone, it would be $9 an acre. Again, I don't recommend that, um, but you can see it's fairly low cost. There are hybrid turnips out there, which we'll talk about as well. Uh, those hybrid turnips uh, are a little bit more expensive, somewhere around $3.50 a pound. Uh, there's also kale and rape. As you can see, they're somewhere in the middle, $2.75, as well as collards at $2.50. Um, what I will show you is that, uh, that they're not very different in terms of their forage quality. Now brassicas, are, um, and radishes in particular, are winter sensitive as well. The daikon oilseed radish uh, is pictured here as the most common one being used right now. It's also marketed like the eco tillage radish, the nitro radish, those are all a form of a daikon oilseed radish. Uh, they have a bigger seed so they are uh, seeded traditionally about 10 pounds per acre for a full seeding rate. Again, if you are to put it into a mix, you're going to back that down some. Uh, cost is 250 to 365 a pound, and so they are a bit more expensive. In terms of seeding rates, uh, cattle will eat them. Uh, they will eat the bulb. This is a picture of a calf in December uh, consuming uh, one of the bulbs or the roots of the radish. 
In terms of uh, forage quality, uh, let's look at the fall quality of cereal grasses. We have wheat, we have oats, this is an early maturing variety. We have a late maturing or a forage variety, we have triticale. And if we look at um, two planting dates, one here with a growing degree days of uh, 1179, uh, that's equivalent to about September 11th uh, through the 20th here in Nebraska, uh, the 20th being southeastern Nebraska, of course, or a earlier planting date in August, August 15th to August 25th in Nebraska. And as we look at these two planting dates for these four species, what we see is not very much difference in the TDN or the energy value uh, with the exception of this early maturing oat that was planted very early, we do see that the energy value is about uh, 3 to 5 uh, percent lower in terms of its TDN value. And that's because it's higher in lignin. Lignin is that woody substance uh, or that woody f um, fiber that is not digestible by the animal. Um, and so as we look at this, Really the message is the quality isn't all that different between these species. If you're going with a very early planting date, uh, you will lose a little bit of quality if you go with an early maturing oat. But not much, still very high quality. And then the other thing I want to point out is the NDF level. This is the fiber level and you can see that it's about uh, 40 uh, to 50 percent NDF. This is important because uh, we want to mix them with those brassicas, which I'll show you are very low NDF, to make a good diet for our uh, ruminants. Now the spring quality, so if I'm planting a winter hardy species and I want to look at using it for spring forage, it acts more like a traditional um, forage that we would think about as it matures. Uh, we get more yield, but we actually lose some of our quality, so going from the boot to the early doe stage. As we get more mature, we get more tons of dry matter per acre, but uh, we lose crude protein and we lose digestibility. So you have to balance uh, both yield and quality in the spring. In the fall, with the planting dates uh, that we're talking about, somewhere in August, uh, we don't see a lot of changes in quality uh, with the exception of that early maturing oat. Now the nutrient content of the brassicas, uh, this is actually the nutrient content of the radish. This is the daikon oilseed radish, a uh, radish top, um, and the radish tuber or the bulb, and a purple top turnip top as well as the bulb. And these were planted uh, between August 5th and 10th in southeastern Nebraska, and then right before freeze we harvested them. And what we see is very high crude protein levels in our tops, 18 for the turnip, or excuse me, the radish, 13 for the turnip. Uh, still fairly good for the tubers, 8% for our tubers. Again, the fiber here is really low in the leaf as well as the tubers, and this is a problem if we were to seed them alone. Uh, it's not enough fiber. Uh, we, cattle will be very loose and uh, will have digestive upset, so we do suggest actually adding a grass into the mix. Uh, traditionally, we would say somewhere around 50 to 60 pounds of oats with 3 to 4 pounds of a turnip is a, is a nice mix uh, for uh, grazing cattle. The other thing I wanted to show you here is that the sulfur content of these brassicas are very high, 0.5 to 0.6. Uh, the maximum tolerable level is currently stated to be between 0.3 and 0.4 percent uh, sulfur in the diet, and so we need to mix uh, these brassicas with the grass. Oats are usually around 0.2 just to dilute out that sulfur and avoid problems with uh, polyencephalomalacia or sulfur toxicity. The bottom line, brassicas are very digestible, 80 to 90 percent digestible, and so uh, can be very good quality feed for a relatively low cost. Just to avoid those issues of low fiber and high sulfur, put a, put a grass in the mix as well. Now there's a couple different types of turnips. 
um, the most traditional is the purple top uh, white globe it's that's that buck 80 that I was talking about before there's also a green globe um, both of those do produce a bulb there's um, some leafy types like the appen it does still produce a bulb but it's supposed to produce more leaf then there's some hybrids like the Paja that's pictured here uh, the Winifred and the Hunter uh, they're mixed uh, the Winifred is mixed with a rape and so it does not produce a bulb uh, in terms of productivity why would I choose one over the other well uh, the truth is that the purple top turnip uh, likely is is the cheapest and if you're not going to have multiple grazings it may be the way to go uh, especially in the cover crop type system because we don't get enough time for growth to accumulate uh, such that they put a lot of energy into producing the bulb. The one exception would be early planted um, after wheat. Uh, at that point you might see a little bit more leaf growth um, out of uh, one of these hybrids. However, cattle will eat the bulbs if you leave them in there. Uh, usually they do eat the leaves first and then they'll come back and eat the bulbs. If you're going to do multiple grazings, uh, one of the benefits of some of these hybrids is that uh, they're less susceptible to damage um, that would keep them from regrowing. Um, I have seen uh, hoof damage on the bulbs of the purple top turnips where they do start uh, to rot and so and cattle do tend to dislodge them a little bit more so multiple grazings there might be a benefit. In terms of nutrient content though we look at the different types of turnips we see really no difference in protein, uh, fiber, uh, ADF, which kind of gives us an idea of energy, uh, which is, there's really no difference there. And um, non-structural carbohydrates, that's really the sugar. It's very high and also not different. If we look at fall yield of the brassicas, and I'm only looking at the top growth or the leaf, um, at basically three different planting dates, either uh, really early planted in green, that's August 15th, August 25th, kind of after uh, late after winter wheat or planted into seed corn or maybe very early harvested uh, corn silage. Then in the blue we kind of have a, a middle date uh, August 23rd to September 1st that, that would be a traditional corn silage or um, a little bit later planting August 31st to September 10th and really that's in red really what we're what we're looking at is what's the difference in growth between the purple top turnip, the Winifred, the hunter, um, a rape, or a dwarf kale. And what we see is that with the early planting date in green, we see that yes, the Winifred did produce more uh, leaf growth than uh, the purple top turnip. Hunter was about the same as purple top, uh, the rape. Uh, which tends to be a little bit later maturing, also produced uh, more growth uh, than the Hunter and the Purple Top, as well as uh, both uh, the Winifred and the Rape were a little more productive than the Kale. Now as we move to the next planting date, that August 23rd, September 1st, we see that that pretty much washes out. There's really no difference among any of these at that point. Uh, so bottom line, really early planted, there may be an advantage to something like Winifred um, or a rape, remember. Uh, however, when we look at uh, those later planting dates, we see no benefit to the extra cost. So if, uh, if you want more information about using these annual cool season forages uh, for late fall or early spring double crop, we do have a NEB guide out there. Um, you can find it on our IANR publication webpage as well as there's a link on our beefunl.edu.